Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very exciting session that we're going to be um, having today. Welcome to Accelerator and Africa Tech. I've got two amazing speakers um, that I'm really keen to have a conversation with. And our topic for today is how do we um, accelerate, um, how do we encourage and accelerate more women to join um, the industry of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, so we can actually drive socioeconomic development. Um, my name is Ellen Fishett. I am an impact entrepreneur based in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, I have a boutique agency, consulting agency in uh, digital uh, programs, specifically for women and youth in Africa. And I run various uh, incubation and acceleration programs, pan-African programs. Um, I would like to introduce you to uh, the two absolute trailblazers uh, that will be joining us today. So the first speaker that I'm going to introduce you to is Emma Dix. Emma is the director at Codespace. It's an educational institution, an edtech company that specializes in coding and software development. Um, Codespace has received a numerous amount of, of global recognition. Emma is, is highly uh, decorated and awarded for the initiatives. She's been driving Code for Cape Town initiative that focuses on educating uh, girls and young women in, in software development and in coding um, to ensure that not only they educate themselves, but they can really build a financially independent uh, life for themselves. She's a dedicated global advocate for a more diverse and inclusive economy. Um, Emma's work has been recognized by um, the Fortune Most, far, most Powerful Women, uh, Google, Mail and Guardian, um, and she's also been recognized uh, by Her Royal Majesty the Queen, who honored her with the Queen's Young Leader Award as a South African, uh, successful South African social entrepreneur. Um, the things that Emma does, she's very well known in the, in the tech scene in South Africa, also based in Cape Town. Um, she's spoken at numerous uh, conferences in London, um, in Nairobi, also in Johannesburg. Um, just um, she's a, a, a leading, not only thought leader, but she's also a doer and uh, a very, uh, very good friend of mine. I'm very help welcome and I'm very happy to introduce her and to have this conversation with Emma. Um, my next speaker that I would like to introduce you to is um, I was thrilled and so excited when I heard that um, Julia would be uh, joining us today. Julia, sorry, I just moved it back, give me a second. So Julia, everyone is, um, she hails from uh, uh, West Africa. She's the country director for strategy at Google West Africa, recognized by the London School of Business as one of the 30 people that is changing the world and named also as Forbes top 20 younger powerhouses of women in Africa. She's featured on BBC Africa Power series. Um, Julia is really a thought leader. I'm terribly excited to be having this opportunity and for, uh, for her to be sharing her story and her, her vision and her strategy with us today. Um, she has over 20 years experience primarily in technology, new media, and has also worked in the oil and gas industry. Um, many, many industries across Europe, Middle East and Africa. Juliet is a fellow of the Cambridge University, the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth Advisory Board on Sustainable Development Goals and of Leap Africa. Not only is she a powerhouse in terms of business and, and her strategic leadership of, of our continent and specifically West Africa, she is also the founder of Beyond Limits Africa, a leadership and organizational capacity building. Welcome ladies, it is an absolute honor to have you here. How are you doing today? Thank you very much, Aline. We're doing, I'm doing very, very well. Great to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, Emma, how are you doing? No, it's such a pleasure to be um, talking with you both. I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, so I've got lots of questions. They are based on um, the questions that are often asked to myself, but also I know that other women in general get these questions, and especially for um, business people, uh, young women, uh, ladies that are aspiring to go into tech. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. We're going to talk about how we get into the space, what are the barriers, but we're also generally going to be looking at what the opportunities are, because it's also important to note 
uh, these. And also, I think, to demystify some of um, the ideas that people have. Um, yes, you are trailblazers, but we're going to give them some information as to how young women in their career, but also those that are thinking of starting tech businesses can actually do, us, do this. So, Juliet, I'd like to start with you. Could you give me a, a brief outline and indication about how um, you started your incredible career in technology. Uh, where did this passion for technology and innovation come from and what sparked it? Thank you very much, Aline. So um, I would say growing up, I had an aptitude for science and technology. And at the time and in this environment, there were usually just two options. It's either you went into medicine or engineering. Now, I didn't feel like I had the stomach for medicine. And so engineering was an obvious choice. Also at the time, um, computing was just starting to become popular. And I was really intrigued by what was possible with uh, um, you know, computers and all of that. And so mm -hmm. I, I was looking for something different, something challenging and exciting as well. And so computing and engineering just seemed like a perfect fit um, and a field that I felt I could make a difference in. And um, so far I haven't been disappointed. Uh, when you say, um, Juliet, at the time, what time are we talking about? When are yeah. we talking about? Yeah, so this was in the late 80s. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm and, not and, and were there many? <laughs> <laughs> and were there many, were there many other women that were studying with you? No. So uh, when I went into university to study computer engineering, there was just one other woman in my class. So in a class of over 40 people, there were just two women. And at the time, that was uh, that was the trend. A very daunting. It still is. I can only imagine then if you're one of two in the class. Um, thank you, Juliet. Um, Emma, I'm going to ask you. How did you get into how did you get into this whole tech world that you're leading? Well, I, I love the fact that Juliet um, talked about not having a stomach for medicine because I have a very, very small little scar on my, my face here from when I hit the table during a biology crack. And at that moment, my dreams of um, going into medicine shattered. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I think that the, the reason that I wanted to go into medicine was because I wanted to impact people. And you know, that was the story that we were given is that if you wanted to impact people, you became a doctor. Um, but clearly that's, that's not the only um, possible route. And fast forward, you know, that was, that was uh, during early you know, high school. And then um, when I was graduating, I, I interned um, in, a, in a tech company that was working in the mobile health space. And this suddenly opened my eyes to the, the idea that you can, you don't have to be a doctor um, to be able to contribute into the, the um, uh, medical sector and re really have an impact on people there. And that it's so sparked my imagination. But at that time, I was finishing my studies and I realized that there had been some decisions um, where, you know, I'd, I'd chosen to take one path when I could have taken the other. Um, I'd chosen to take non-technical study path when I could have, um, I really could have taken a technical study path. And that would have given me this, you know, the opportunity to have a very different role in those tech companies. Um, and yeah, that, that really excited, excited me. The, the thing is, is that I have a very determined personality. So um, when I realized I didn't have the skill of coding, I very swiftly um, set about uh, teaching myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> Self-taught. Yeah, but, and there really was this, um, this sudden realization as to the incredible power um, that I would have if I, if I understood how yeah. to build technology. And that's what drove mm -hmm. me forward. So I hear you, Emma, speaking about, you know, you wanted to have impact and um, you said two things. I wanted to have impact. And the other thing was also that um, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, I could have uh, going into tech didn't mean I, or being scientific didn't mean I had to be a doctor. I'd like to go back to you, Juliet, and ask the question, um, you know, you, you were one of two. How did was there impact involved when you were doing uh, computer science engineering? What was your thinking? Did you know that this was going to be, this is where you would be today? Julia, you're on mute. Oh, my apologies. Yes, so when I started out, the focus was just really 
being the best I could be in that field. Mm -hmm. And so I threw myself into it and gave it my all. However, as things progressed, I found the field increasingly interesting. The fact that um, things changed quite rapidly. Uh, there was so much you can do. You could do so many things with, uh, with computers, with computing technology, uh, then digital technology, the opportunities and everything. And so that has really um, just uh, gotten me to stay on in the field. The fact that you know, I can make a difference, I can see how te technology transforms lives and it's just remained stimulating and challenging because there's always something to learn. There's always um, something new to try and develop and so on. Great. Um, I've got another question for you built on what both of you were saying. So I heard both of you speaking about, um, so you said, um, Juliet, you're focused, you're driven, you know, you knew this is what you wanted to do. And Emma, you, and you said you wanted to be the best, Juliet. And Emma, you said, um, you know, I was confident that I could learn something and that I realized you both realized the power that technology could have on people's lives. Um, one question that a lot of women uh, in their career or younger girls that are thinking of going into technology is, um, and what I notice is they don't have the confidence. So I'm wondering, speaking to both of you, especially if you're one of two girls, um, you know, in a class, and which is still a current reality uh, in a lot of universities or classes, or girls don't know that they can choose something scientific. Um, they don't know what kind of subjects they would choose. Um, is there is there still hope for us that are maybe a bit shy and you know we're not we, we we don't think we're the best or we're not confident about ourselves and Juliet I have to say women from West Africa are absolute powerhouses I feel like we should all do internships <laughs> because these women are amazing so I don't know just for the ones that are maybe a bit shy what would you say about knowing your focus and understanding uh, what your drive is even though you are a minority. Thank you, Ellen. I would say that it's really impossible. It's really important to believe in yourself and to know that your dreams are valid and that you deserve a shot at making them happen. We've also seen an increasing trend in women doing amazing things, including leadership positions in the technology space. So whilst the, in the past you had fewer role models, fewer um, success examples to look at, right now we have uh, you know, a lot more women coming into the technology field, a lot more women in the workplace in technology and also in leadership positions. So um, for anyone who's aspiring to have a career in technology, just look at the stories of these women and some of these examples as well, because uh, being able to see examples can help fuel that aspiration and can help crystallize your vision just having that sense of the fact that it is possible and just like with everything else it's really about you know believing in yourself and going for it and there are so many tools that can just really um, help you to um, just get ahead and just get a grip of the different um, concepts and, and um, ideas that you would need to uh, understand. It's also worth mentioning that the tech, tech field is quite broad and so there are many different areas of specialization that you can go into that just really that you have an affinity for and so I would say don't shy away. Um, you have a shot at really going for it and um, having your dreams fulfilled. I love that. Before before I come to you, Emma, with because my question is going to be a bit longer for you, I, I'd like to stay on the point where you are, Julia. So, Juliet, so for some of the people that are watching us today that are joining in the session, um, you know, you are actually um, celebrated. Who you're actually celebrated as a woman who coined the frame a phrase about the next Bill Gates is female and African. And you've you, you alluded to this earlier about having that vision and going for it, not shying away. Um, you spoke about uh, there's many women in leadership and we actually have to follow their, look at their journeys and their paths to see what they are doing. How do we, can you give us a bit more uh, detail on how do we prepare women to have this clear vision of, of careers in technology. So you spoke about leadership. I know you're very big on strategy. Um, what, what more can you, can you tell us, but also the corporates that are, are listening in in this and they're looking at their pipeline and how they actually move more women um, in, in, in STEM. What, what can you share with us about that? 
Sure. So starting with the article, it's an article I wrote for International Women's Day in 2018. The title, The Next Bill Gates is Female and African, was a bold assertion intended to inspire women in technology and entrepreneurship in Africa. And why not? Because um, even though the statement was aspirational, when you look at the stats that we have today, they, they buttress that story. Um, although only one in four tech workers are female, the trajectory for female participation is trending upwards. I mentioned that when I started out, there were just two of us in my class, right? Um, but we're seeing we're, we're seeing that increase right now. We have, you know, we've gone from a mere four percent female participation in STEM to about thirty percent in the uh, in comparison today. Mm -hmm. So there's of course a lot more work that needs to be done in in addressing gender stereotypes as well as the workplace cultural issues that can stifle the career of female techies. However, I think um, the objective reality, in my view, is that mm -hmm. despite those constraints, there is a slow but gradual, gradual march that is bringing more women in STEM and engineering. And when we combine the increasing influx of women into tech with the fact that they possess a lot of creativity, you know, and when we think about the diversity that that brings into the workplace, I firmly believe that the next wave of growth and innovation can be driven by women. I now, talking that. about. I love that. I'm making a note now, of that. Now, to your point about vision, um, th that's so critical. Certainly in any field, going in with a clear sense of what you want to be and achieve is crucial. And sometimes it's difficult to aspire to something that you can't see, as I was um, mentioning before. So, as the numbers and women in tech increases, which is what we're seeing today. Um, then it's, it becomes easier for people to aspire and to have those clear visions that really just create that picture of what's possible and what you want to be um, in, in the field. Um, and I think that's a very important indicator. And in the workplace, in terms of organizations that are looking to um, just encourage more women into technology and leadership, I think just uh, ensuring that you know, uh, diversity and inclusion is um, something that is top of mind and just an in important part of the culture, ensuring that there's a cultural context that just makes it easy for women to be able to, um, to grow and, and develop. Uh, also bearing in mind some of the constraints that women may have along their career journey, uh, making sure that um, the, the internal policies do support women through different transitions, transitions around going, you know, going on maternity and so on and so forth. Uh, so there needs to be a certain level of intentionality and commitment to just make sure that um, all employees in the totality of who they are, are supported to grow within organizations. And there's a lot of uh, benefits in doing that. Thank you, Juliet. I'm going to come back to you. So um, just summarizing what you're saying for um, those of us that are running tech organizations, um, uh, male or female, or, or even like the larger corporates already, I hear you talking about, um, you know, diversity and inclusion. And, and yes, that's a, a very, um, it's a term that's used a lot, but what does it mean? And I'm, what I'm hearing you say that in practice, that means ensuring that you're intentional about uh, bringing different people uh, to the table and involving them that um, we, we take you know, culture into consideration, cultural context and what that potentially means for, you know, um, I suppose, broadening um, the face uh, of leadership, what that looks like. And I also hear you speaking about um, internal policy. So those are very tangible actions that can be taken and are not fluffy. Um, but before we get there, uh, Juliet, before we are at that strategic level and where policy is really crafted, I'd like to go back um, to you, Emma, because um, a lot of the work, the work that you're known for, the work that um, gets you out of bed, the mission that gets you out of bed every day and just at it. And I know it's a very difficult path and it's not always as glamorous as you look now, you know, from your, your office building and, and having received all these rewards. Could you go back to um, people, the younger uh, women that are listening today, and could you tell us a bit and, and to inspire, I suppose, us as mothers to tell our daughters, choose, you know, scientific. Could you tell us about 
more about why girls don't view um, you know, STEM as, as, as a, a, a viable career path? I mean, this is such a complex um, question. And, you know, so, so many ideas have been put forward as to why, why we don't see women going into STEM. But um, recently, an, an idea that I've really taken hold of is that humans um, derive immense satisfaction from doing good work. More even than what that work is, the, the simple notion of being able to do something with excellence um, is, gives us immense satisfaction. And that's you know, a large part of what one's looking for when one's choosing one's work, um, where, where one's going to, to give one's energy. Um, and I think that this is some, something that, um, you know, it's subconscious, but it's also conscious when, when we're choosing our career paths. We, we think about this when we're choosing our subjects at school, you know, when you're 16 or 15. Um, you think about which subjects could I excel in? You know, that's a, that's a normal question. Then university, which su which study field will I excel in? Because it's natural that we want to choose something that we're going to excel in. And then the next step comes our first job. We're going to naturally think about which job could I do well in? Where can I grow? Where can I learn? When I can, where can I bring something valuable to the world? And of course, this is tied to our remuneration. Um, and so it's, it's logical that we're looking for places where we where we can excel. Um, and so, you know, I do shy away from simply saying, oh, well, you know, choose STEM because we need women there. There, there is an onus on the, the industry itself to make sure that it is indeed a place where women can excel um, before, before we go and encourage women to simply go in there. However, that said, I think that there's never been a moment um, like there is now when, when women really can go into that space and, and, and excel. There's, there's an understanding that women have unique value. Um, and yes, Juliet, you said this, it's, it's such a broad industry. Te technology really is such an incredibly broad industry. And there are so many spaces where women's unique value is, is really, really necessary. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, there, there's, there's something very empowering then as a woman also to have a narrative about, like, we, we're human and our desire to excel is the same as, as everyone else around us. Um, we're not some weird logical being that is simply looking at the STEM industry uh, or STEM fields and saying, oh, no, I don't want that. It's not, it's not no, we're just logical. <laughs> we're asking ourselves the same questions that our male counterparts are. Um, I'm going to st stick with that for a second, um, Emma, because I mean, I mean, I'm a couple of years older than you are. Um, <laughs> so I'm thinking about like, um, you know, you say that and, and, and also coming from a non-tech background and having moved in my career into tech, understanding that I'm not the one that's, that's uh, developing the system or I'm not coding, but I'm the one that's going to support those technical developers as to what would they could they best develop for the users and for, you know from that human and feminine and female and social perspective, um, and and I'm going to bring it back to South Africa because maybe it's it's different in you know in in, in West Africa maybe it's different in Ghana in Nigeria, but in South Africa a lot of girls don't see themselves choosing STEM because you know you speak about excelling. Um, a lot of us think we're terrible at maths or, you know, science is too hard. What, what can we as, uh, as educators do to, to encourage that and to change that narrative? Yeah, um, I, I mean, again, this is um, an immensely complex uh, question, but, you know, I think there's so many, there's so much work to be done in thinking about what does that curriculum look like? Um, is it... Um, for girls first, the assessments, what you know, the, the examples, the projects that are given, are those all things that are going to spark a, a young girl's imagination? And that's really what I, I wanted to do with um, the program that I started, which was um, called Code for Cape Town, was simply to say, let's let's design this for girls first. Let's let's create a program where girls can learn to code, and let's look for those moments that are going to spark their spark their imagination. Um, and really spark that internal motivation that will then drive, drive them forward. Um, and I mean, we saw one in two of the girls who came in that program five years later in STEM 
um, study fields. So it really did have remarkable success. And I think that it really proves that um, women have every chance um, of, of succeeding in that. It's, it's really on, on us to think about how can we spark that internal motivation um, in, inside women. And that I think is about the stories that we tell. Um, you know, are we saying, well, become a programmer because you're going to earn a fantastic salary and you're going to, you know, it will integrate really well with your gaming that you do, which is, I mean, a large part of the story that I had. I was like, well, I don't play games. So, you know, that's really not important to me. Um, uh, and money alone wasn't the thing that drove me. I wanted, I wanted to know, like, how, how could, uh, you know, I find a place in the world um, to, to impact the world, and that, that's really what I was, what I was looking for. And um, so, looking for those, those kind of narratives and things that um, spark, spark a girl's imagination. And what I'm hearing you say, and it goes back to what Juliet was saying about it being so important that um, there's visibility, that uh, young girls, women in their career see Juliet, they see me, they see you, and we're all working in tech and we look completely different and we have completely different backgrounds, but we are in a space um, that is the biggest growing industry. And well, it is, it's not even the future, it's now. Um, Juliet, I'd like to ask you, so if we, from, from the, um, Emma speaks about changing uh, narratives that you speak, and also for, for, for girls, young people to see, you know, it's not only the programmer, but there are so many different, different levels at strategy level. Um, and at the same time, not wanting to be negative, but being real, because both of your work is based upon this from a Google perspective, but also at your, you know, what you're doing in code space in your social enterprise, um, education, and especially access to education for girls in Africa, uh, remains problematic. Um, and it remains, uh, you know, eager access to that, to that, uh, those opportunities. Um, how, Juliet, uh, could you tell us, and that could be from your perspective uh, within your position, but also from uh, the nonprofit that you're running, how do we, how do we change the face of, of education, maybe not change the face of education, but enable more access? You also spoke earlier about so many tools being available. How do we do that practically in Africa? That's a good, great question. So a number of things. I would say... Um, in Africa, connectivity is really important and that can really democratize access to a whole range of opportunities, including access to educational resources. I would say that connectivity is like a bottom line infrastructure table stake from which all is possible. And when we talk about education, I would say education and technology are two sides of the same coin because um, education is really about empowering people with information and knowledge to help them create better lives for themselves. Technology also provides empowerment through access to information and tools that can help you create opportunities for yourself. So, and in today's world, you can't really have one without the other. They're just really, um, there's a lot more power in fusing th them together. And while the numbers of women and children accessing education in classrooms on the continent is growing slowly, we're seeing a more radical growth of female access to educational technologies. If you just take the smartphone as an example, uh, just leveraging the fact that a connected smartphone brings world-class education possibilities mm -hmm. right into your home. You have the world ivory at your fingertips. This can help to address the structural imbalances that exist in the classroom. And so it's important to enable full access for people, particularly people in the rural areas. Digital skills at scale is also critical and they also facilitating supportive communities of learning where you know, women can share and draw strength from one another. But and then talking about remaining, yeah sorry continue sorry please go ahead no 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 you go ahead i've got another question for you i'm holding on to it 
<laughs> so uh, talking about, because part of your question was also um, just from the work that we're doing as Google, I would say a number of things. Internally, there's a huge commitment to diversity and inclusion in all forms. And also in the initiatives we run externally, where we also try to encourage uh, gender diversity and women in technology as much as possible. At the moment we are in Africa, we have a, a program which is to provide free digital skills training to 10 million Africans in five years. We make a conscious effort to ensure that there is gender diversity in the attendees uh, for this program. Uh, and so in some cases we target women groups, et cetera, to just make sure that there is equal representation. Um, we have a conference that runs every year. It's been running annually since 2014 called Women Tech Makers. And this is just really about developing communities of female developers. Um, and every year there's a Women Tech Makers event, which, which is a, you know, a global um, a program uh, in, connecting multiple people, women in leadership, students aspiring, uh, women in technology and all of that to just share tools, share experiences, best practices, and just really uh, show what's possible. And um, we also have uh, female developer groups across the continent and um, just through these groups as well, making sure that women have the tools and the support that they need to be able to be successful in technology careers. Yeah, I like what you're saying. Um, Emma, please don't think you're off the hook because like, I feel we need another hour. I've got, I want to get in because we're talking about socioeconomic growth. You know, I, I want to be very clear that um, it's it's not only, um, and this is my personal bit that I'm just adding on here. It's, it's not about a nice to have. It's not about fluffiness. It's about excluding 50% of your potential buyers, but also your manufacturers and that help you build. So, it makes absolute business sense, you know, it's, it's, it's not something fashionable. Um, so you're not off the hook yet, Emma, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to come to you now. Uh, Juliet, I'd like to do, there's a, um, I'd like you to ask you something. There's a question that uh, uh, came from the audience and, and uh, this person says, it's not enough to teach girl coding skills. We also need to teach them about positive personal branding. It's, I think the confidence is important that you spoke about wanting to be the best and, and you accessing these educational tools. Um, so that they don't become directed. What else can we do? If you have a quick answer besides positive uh, personal branding and the coding skills, the access to information, what else do we do? do you yeah, so that's why I think the supportive communities, yeah. the learning communities are very, are very important because that, those are um, forums where people can um, build their confidence, people can share things that they're struggling with, even insecurities, they can watch other people, that really plays a big role. And that's why we support female developer groups, you know, women tech makers, uh, we have initiatives like Women Will and, and, and different things to just bring um, women together to be able to support, you know, uh, get mentorship um, and just really learn from others. And I do agree with the point as well around, you know, confidence and belief. And, and um, uh, one of the things I, I do with uh, Beyond Limits that you mentioned earlier is just, just really creating opportunities for those kinds of conversations around, you know, mm -hmm. believing in yourself and just ensuring that those limiting beliefs that we sometimes have running the show around, you know, maybe as a woman, I can't succeed in technology or, you know, as, as I have to be geeky to have a career mm -hmm. in technology or I can't succeed in, in, in leadership positions in technology because of various reasons. All the different um, uh, stereotypes or limiting beliefs that, you know, that we've had over time to be able to transform those to empowering beliefs and look at the evidence supporting those empowering beliefs. I love that word about the evidence. So um, Emma and I are both inspiring 50 South African women. Uh, and we, we, you know, it's all about, as you speak about with Accelerator, we're all about visibility. You need to see that tech looks like me and that I am tech, you know, even though, um, and, and I'm wearing, you know, I've got red lipstick, but I'm tech. Uh, Emma, I'm going to come to you because I want to challenge you, well, not challenge you, but encourage you to speak um, 
so there's two things. A community is very important because that's it's it's our network, right? It's it's the ones that are going to give you inside information that are going to, um, you know, give you insights that you may not have. But from a uh, making your money, making building a career, um, Emma, what can you tell us uh, when it comes to um, the socioeconomic uh, development that, uh, that that is driven through tech. So basically, I think I'm asking you like, even if we're not coders and we're not developers, are we going to be making those big bucks? Are we going to be feeding our families, you know, and not being dependent? Right. I mean, um, so so if I understand if I understand your your question correctly. The, um, I mean, I think, yes, that there is absolutely, you know, many, many of the different roles in the tech industry are, you know, valued highly. Um, and so, you know, yes, there, there's the sort of the pure software engineering route, which is, you know, traditionally very, very well paid, but there are, there are these other, um, you know, other routes within the tech industry that, you know, equally so. Um, is is that what you were? That's that's the one thing that I, no, you're 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 answering that correctly, and it goes back to, and I'm just trying to affirm this message because a lot of women think you need to be a developer to, um, you right. know, that's the only option that you have, and I think the other thing that I want to ask you because a lot of your work is educational, and it's probably also sometimes maybe deemed as more of the softer work, you know, mm -hmm. um, because there's a different kind of approach and encouragement and like leadership that and nurture that is required. Um, but I think what people don't always understand is that um, we, we do this differently as, as leaders in, in technology, but we address problems like health and education. So I think maybe just your thinking, I, I'd like to get some of your thoughts yeah. because what you do is hardcore tech, but it's just approached differently. Yeah. So, I mean, um, in terms of um, you, you know, the, the education, the, pro the programs that, that I provide, so uh, you know, we, we operate Codespace Academy. That's an education institution that provides, you know, the um, incredibly high quality tech education that can get someone with the skills, the hard skills that they need mm -hmm. to go into the tech industry. However, that's then cushioned with um, nonprofit programs that look specifically at who is accessing that um, mm -hmm. and how are they able to leverage that. Because the thing is, is that um, certain different people in society, if you give them education, they're able to take that in different directions. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I, as a white South African, am able to take the education that I have and through the social capital that I have, I'm able to take that um, places that perhaps a uh, um, young black woman whose um, you know, social network is limited perhaps to mm -hmm. uh, the township areas of Cape Town, it looks very, very different as the kind of uh, networks that you have. And so I think that one, one cannot simply say that we can, you know, we just need to give someone access to information or access to education. We really, really have to be looking at what kind of access to, to networks um, do people have, what access to funding, um, and how, how, how can we, um, you know, face those hard, hard realities of the fact that people have yeah, completely different opportunities to take what they as an individual have and leverage that, that into society. So, you know, a lot of the work that um, I do is saying, well, if we want young women to go into tech, we need we need cool, cool hard cash behind those young women. Um, we, you know, we can't just be saying, oh, we made them feel so good, and you know, they they, they look good. <laughs> mm -hmm. The world only cares so much. So, um, coming to, um, I'm going to come back to that question, Juliet. Oh, I've got so many questions for you guys, and and there's there's one lot. There's a couple that I want to uh, make, but um, Juliet, I want to ask you, so Emma mentioned, she says, it's not only about access to the technology, it's not only about access to the information, but it's then, um, and we know this as business women, it's then being able to convert that into uh, not only earning a living for your own income for yourself, but actually growing a business and, and uh, creating economic opportunities for other people, you know, uh, in your community. I want to ask you if you think it is possible that uh, from a perspective as well, you know, like the Google Academy and uh, the tools that we that, that one can access with the smartphone and, and with the platform, the Google platform, 
um, do you believe that we could leapfrog some of these like formal um, paths whereby, you know, you needed to study for four years, then you did went to business school? Do you think that there's opportunity for, for women in Africa, in rural communities, in agriculture, through fashion design to create earning uh, opportunities for themselves and enterprises? I absolutely think so. And we've seen um, success stories and evidence of that. Uh, we've seen a lot of people who didn't study computer science or engineering or computing of any sort in school get into uh, the tech field, either um, going through certifications, short courses, certification programs, learning on the job, and so on. And so I think these tools, these uh, digital platforms and, and, and tools and, and learning platforms online just really you know, help to close the gap Mm -hmm. And we just really make it possible for people to accelerate their entry into the field, their capacity building uh, as well. So um, absolutely, I think it, it presents a great opportunity. And um, I've seen, you know, one example comes to mind. Sometimes it's great to even share some of the real stories that we that we experience because it brings this to life. Um, I, I do recall uh, one of my favorite success stories, an, an aspiring developer, a female aspiring developer mm -hmm. um, in, in Abuja in Nigeria who uh, was just you know, self-teaching at home. And then she got um, uh, to learn about our uh, developer training program in partnership with Andela. Uh, she applied for it, got the scholarship, um, and joined the community of uh, developers, male and female, uh, got trained, got certified. And then almost immediately, she got a job where she earned 10 times her previous salary. And that completely transformed her life, transformed her family, et cetera. So there are, there's a lot of real evidence of the fact that these tools just really um, re break the barriers to entry and make it possible for more people to self-educate, to self-empower, and to just build capacity. Thank you so much. I, I'd like to sign testament to one of those people that also, uh, <laughs> you know, Google's your best friend to teach yourself, and also like tenfolded my salary coming from a tradition, and there's nothing wrong with the traditional, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying as women, we really need, need to look at the opportunities and the, these powers that we have in terms of education, um, Emma, a lot of what you're doing and how that actually translates into um, industries that are that are creating and making money i'm very conscious of time emma um last question that i only have time for for you and then just very briefly uh, can you tell me and you as well juliet what advice do you have for uh, those that want to enter the tech industry and who want to make um, yeah what advice would you give women that want to enter the tech industry um <laughs> i mean the first advice that, that, that comes to the top of my, my head is that the, the skill that you're bringing is your ability to learn. The te tech industry is moving so fast. Um, you can't make a list of skills today that um, you know, are, go are going to take you forward. What you need to do is foster that ability to learn, um, which is an inherently uncomfortable process. So you know, really getting un um, comfortable with the, um, the, the process of being uncomfortable and pushing yourself and learning is... Is, is so I love that. I love that. It, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be the minority in the group because um, essentially, if you can work your way through that, navigate that, um, the few, you know, the world's your oyster. Thank you, Emma. Juliet, from your side. I would say that there isn't just one path. That there is a diversity of paths that you can take, and it's important to just look at what you have the greatest affinity for, and then going for it. Um, don't feel you have to compromise who you are. Be comfortable in even asking questions or asking for help, right? right? Sometimes we think, well, then now I have to prove myself and I have to be a superwoman, right? To show that I deserve a seat at the mm -hmm. table. Uh, there's nothing wrong with asking for help uh, and just, uh, uh, you know, maintaining the integrity of who you are and just really, um, you know, believing that uh, you can get as far as you desire to. Oh, I love that. 
Thank you so very much. It's been an incredible honor. I'm totally fired and inspired um, to be to have spoken to you to learn, uh, get your insights to amazing women from different worlds doing different things, but showing um, those that have joined us today and the women that are watching. And especially like Juliet said, you know, it doesn't matter. I went into Korea, I went into tech at the age of 30. So you know, it's never too late. As long as you're wanting to learn, I'd like to encourage um, our viewers um, to please, if you have any more questions, you can send them to the organizers, reach out to Emma and uh, Juliet through LinkedIn. You've got a community of women that are, are, are there to support you, uh, to serve you. Please um, reach out and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, ladies.